we're used to in the state of Florida. Uh, it's funny, I have to tell you, so uh, we don't currently have our seven, five, and three-year-old with us because the little one had the flu, and so she's going to be back with us next week. Uh, but what was really cool is a week ago Saturday, the kids, for the first time, this was in Sioux City, had the chance to see snow, which was what they had never seen it before. They'd always seen it on TV and was wondering, what is this mystical stuff that's coming down from the heavens? The only thing about it is, is that they saw snow for the first time at 0530 in the morning through the hotel window. And so what do they decide to do? They decide to jump on mom and dad's bed because they wanted to go downstairs to touch it, right? And it wasn't even like the snow had gone across everything. It was like what was left over when the snow plow came by, right? And it was on the corner of a parking lot. So here's Ron and me doing paper, rock, scissors at 5.30 in the morning to try to figure out who is going to dress three small children, go downstairs to take the kids to go touch snow. So we did, we went down, we got coffee, we did it. And of course they wanted to like make snow angels and do snowballs and I just wanted to go inside, right? But they, they have had fun being on the campaign trail and uh, my, my son, so I have to tell you, my oldest is Madison, you guys might have seen her, so she just turned seven. For the longest time, she was telling everyone she is six and three-fourths. Now she is officially seven years old. She tells everyone how to run the household. Then you have Mason, who's our five-year-old, and Mamie, our little three-year-old, who is the first baby born to a sitting governor of the state of Florida in 50 years, which is pretty cool. So we have baby-proof the place as best as possible because they like to run in with you know macaroni and cheese colored crayons into the state dining room, but we haven't done any destruction. We figure out that those magic erasers work really well to get things off of the uh, really nice wallpaper, um, which is fine. So Mason, I have a quick story because I love talking about my kids and people say, why do you talk about your kids so much? Because I love them. And they're the reason why we fight so hard. They're the reason why we're doing a lot of this because we want to give to our kids to your kids and to your grandkids in America better than the one that we had when we were growing up. We want them to be able to achieve the American dream. So Mason, who is our five-year-old, he loves his dad. Like, he is the biggest Ron DeSantis fan in the world. And you would say, okay, of course that would happen. But he's, like, really invested in this. So he watches all of the debates. He watches his interviews. If he's on TV and we're sitting in the hotel lobby, he'll point and see Daddy on TV. The other thing he loves, too, is football. And he loves to keep score of the football games. He has a little magic eraser and a drawing board, and he'll write out the scores during the football season. He loves the Jags, loves the Dolphins, what have you, Florida team. Well, the other day he was watching the uh, Newsom debate with Ron, which was a lot of fun, I'm not going to lie. And, and he, but he fell asleep about half of the way through, and he woke up the next morning, and he goes, Mama, he goes, who, who won? And I said, Buddy, Dad won, and he won big. And he goes, really? He goes, what was the score? And I, was like, I was like, I stopped keeping count, Mason. He won a little lost it a long time ago. Uh, Newsom, Newsom did. But, um, you know, it's funny, too, because you wonder, at, like a kindergarten, how much are they really, you know, paying attention? Or is it just the fact that he's watching Dad? So one of the things that really, and this, and this is important, right, for us, because we bring our kids with us because, yes, we understand that they grow up so quickly. We don't want to miss anything. And it's the number one thing that I hear when I travel out throughout Iowa and beyond. is like, you blink, you miss it. Your kids are going to be in college. So we, we try to spend as much time with them as humanly possible. But also, we're going to be handing off this republic to them. And so we feel it's important to be able to give them a good foundation to understand where do our rights come from. They don't come from the government. They come from our creator. Government is put in place to protect the rights that we innately have. Like, you can never start too early with teaching the kids, you know, what, what, it, what it means to be, you know, inheriting a republic. So the other day, I'm walking down a little, uh, a little hallway, and Mason comes up to me, he tugs me, and he looks at me, and he goes, he goes, Mama. And this is how I know he really understands what's going on. He goes, Mama. I was like, yeah, buddy. And he looks at me, and he goes, our nation is in decline. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're right. So... Before too long, you're not, you won't see Ron, you'll see little five-year-old Mason DeSantis coming up in here and giving speeches. So uh, speaking of debates, you know, you saw on Wednesday the governor I won yet another debate and really showed the vision for the future of the country and, and, and showed, you know, how he has the record to back up everything that he's going to say that he, that he has said that he's going to do. And, you know, one of the things from a mom's perspective that I really appreciated that that debate highlighted was he is the only man, the only person on that stage, the only candidate in this race, Republican, Democrat, Independent, who's going to stand up for the rights of parents and defend the innocence of our children, without question. 
and that is really important because I know a lot of moms and grandmoms and dads and granddads too would agree with me. I never thought, I never thought in America that anyone would ever use our children as a vehicle to advance their ideology or agenda. But we're starting to see this, and we cannot sit idly by and allow this to happen. We can't let there be pornography in schools or to have sexualized curriculum thrust in front of five-year-olds. It's inappropriate. So you need someone who's going to stand up for our kids, and he is the guy that's going to get that done. And you're right, and I don't need to make sure that he does it because I know that he will, but I will kick him out the door gracefully if necessary. <laughs> so I'll say this. Um, when I have the opportunity to introduce a better half, there's so many things that I could say, and I feel really compelled to get out a lot of content in a short amount of time because you want to hear from the better half because I think, you know, what, what is it that I want you to know about Ron DeSantis? And yes, you know he's a father of a seven, five, and a three-year-old, and that's important because he understands what parents are dealing with about everything from the economy to education to public safety to having law enforcement's back. You know, I want him, you, you all to know that, you know, he's been a really good husband to me. I mean, he really has taught me how to be a fighter. You know, I'm getting hit too, and you know, and, and this has happened, but he has taught me. He has always said it doesn't matter how hard you get hit, it matters how hard you keep moving forward on behalf of the folks. And so he's given me a lot of strength throughout, not only since he's been governor, but you know, when I was facing some pretty significant health battles, he gave me a lot of courage and a lot of strength when I didn't even have the courage and strength to fight for myself, especially through six rounds of chemotherapy, three surgeries, and six weeks of radiation. But he was with me the whole time, giving me hope and, and taking care of my kids when it was really difficult for me to do that. I think a little bit about how it's important to know that he is the only guy that served in the United States military in this race. And he deployed to Iraq in 2007 as part of the Navy SEAL Team Command Staff. And this is, I think this is important because it shows you who he is, right? So he, I think he would, he, so he, he went to Yale and Harvard. He's the only guy to go through those two liberal universities and come out more conservative on the other side. <laughs> Not very many people can say that, but he did do it. And after he was, was getting ready to graduate, now, this is when 9-11 happened. And he saw what was happening to our country. And he had opportunities to do other things, sure. But he wanted to join the military and commission as an officer because not only did he want to give back to the country that had given him so much, he wanted to fight for what made this country exceptional when our country was under attack. And so I think that speaks very highly of his character. And then he'll talk about the battles that he's, he's won in Florida because, you know, as Republicans, we are tired of losing, right? It just seems like over and over and over and losing on all of these issues, but not in Florida. Because he battled the teachers' union and won. He battled Disney and he won. He stood up for our law enforcement when there were Soros-backed prosecutors who weren't enforcing the law as it was written. He went in and removed them from their post. And so he has been leading the charge and winning. And then what I think is important when you talk about winning, when he was first elected in 2018, he won by 32,000 votes in a state of 22 million people. And everybody said, you know, when you get elected, I remember because they were like lobbying me and they were saying, hey, don't, you know, don't do anything to... You know, bold here because this is a swing state. If you do anything, you know, it's going to go in the direction of the Democrats because the elections in Florida were typically very thin margins. Like he won by 0.4 percent. I mean, we're usually our elections were determined by hanging chads, right? And so, <laughs> not anymore. Uh, so he went in though, and he stood up for what he knew in his heart was right. He led with bold colors, as Reagan would say, not pale pastels. And when you do that, what does that translate into? Do you bring the state together? And he did. And he ended up winning by the largest uh, win by any Republican governor in the history of the state of Florida by 1.5 million votes. He won by 20 points when he had won the first time by 0.4%. And that shows when you do and you lead and you talk about what you're doing and you articulate that to the folks, you can win nearly 10% of women, which was the first Republican governor to do that. You can win nearly 20% of independents, nearly 30% of Hispanics, more than 50% of single women. He was able to bring the state together, and I'll tell you what, our nation right now, we need to be unified. And this shows that it can be done, and it should give hope to the entire world. And then the last thing, I think this is the most important thing, like because I could go on forever. But this is really, it, it, because I have a unique perspective on all of this, right? Like, I see him in front of the cameras, 
I see him in front of the podium giving speeches or battling it out with the media, but I also see him at home. And I see what he's like in the, in the midst of all of these really big battles, particularly like COVID. And just like your governor, the whole world descended upon the state of Florida during COVID. They were coming after him with every nasty thing you could possibly imagine. You turn on the TV, they were hitting him. He would roll out of the bed and they were hitting them. But every single day, he would arm himself with the truth, the evidence, with the full armor of God, the belt of truth, and he would go out and he would fight and he would never back down. And I think that that is important. <laughs> You're coming with us. Wherever we go, you're coming with us. But I think that that's important because too often do we elect people, Republicans, who go up to Washington, who say they're going to do all these wonderful things, and then they end up going rogue, and they never do what the people sent them up there to do. They either want to be liked by the cocktail class, or they want to go to the embassy parties, or they're concerned what the Beltway media is going to say about them. But this is a guy who every day of the week and twice on Sunday was being hit, and he held the line in defense of people's rights, liberties, livelihoods, and happiness. He kept the schools open. He fought to make sure that people could work to put food on the table for their families, that loved ones could be with their loved ones in the final moment of their life. On and on it goes. And I think that this is important because I've learned you're going to get hit. When you're doing the right things and you're standing up for truth, that they're going to come after you. And now more than ever, we need a fighter in Washington who's going to stand up knowing that they're going to get hit, but who's never going to back down for you. And I can guarantee everything that I witnessed firsthand. And that's why people say, like, why do you come out here and do this? Because I would not be able to look at myself in the mirror knowing everything about who he is and what he fights for if I didn't come out here and sing his praises because I'm so proud of everything that he has done. So with that, know that you've got a fighter. You've got someone who will never let you down and will ensure that we get this country back on track. So it's my honor to introduce my hero, my better half, my best friend, Ron DeSantis, the next president of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. How are you all doing? Thanks so much. Well, it's great to be here. I want to thank my wife for the great introduction and for all that she does for our family, the state of Florida, and then ultimately for the United States of America, because she's going to be a great first lady for this country. I can tell you that. And she has, you know, our kids are first grade, kindergarten, and pre-K three. And so she, Casey has promised the American people, and I can validate this promise and back it up. Uh, when we're in the White House, the only thing you're going to have to worry about our kids bringing home is homework, not cocaine. You're not going to have any problems. My, 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 kid, my son in kindergarten is not going to be bringing in any foreign income from China or Ukraine. Don't worry about that. It's going to be, uh, everything's going to be on the up and up. We're, uh, we're excited to be here in Iowa. Uh, we're excited that uh, Iowans get to actually vote. Uh, as much as pundits think you shouldn't be able to vote, uh, you guys actually get to be able to, to make a decision about the future of this country. And, and I'm running for president because I think on the current course, we're in jeopardy of being the first generation of Americans to leave to our kids and grandkids an America less prosperous and less free than the one we inherited. And if that is able to happen, we'd be the first generation to do that, and we would be breaking faith with every generation of Americans from the revolution all the way to the present, who always stepped up and fought when freedom was under attack and ensured that their kids and grandkids would be able to realize the American dream. So on our current course, this country is plunging towards failure. But I don't think this is inevitable. I think it's a choice. This is a choice that we as Americans will be able to make. We need to reverse this country's decline. Uh, we need to usher in an American revival. And we need a new birth of freedom all across this land. And that's what I'll deliver as president of the United States. How do you do it? Well, you need a president who's going to be willing to fight for you. You see the left. They control all these institutions, universities, corporations, bureaucracies. And they just steamroll conservatives in so many parts of this country. And you have a lot of these Republicans, they don't even fight back. Uh, they basically just run for cover. That is unacceptable. So me, I've shown it as governor, I'll do it as president. Uh, I'm going to dig in. 
Uh, and I am going to fight for what's right. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight for your family. I'm going to fight for your freedoms. And Casey mentioned a couple times uh, where we've shown that. When, when COVID hit, for example, um, you know, I was pretty much on an island of fighting back against Fauci, against the media, against the left, the Democrats, even a lot of Republicans. Uh, they said, oh, you can't have kids in school. You have to close beaches. You can't have businesses open, all these other things. And I was getting hit from all sides. Uh, people said that uh, my popularity was plunging. I wasn't going to be able to, to do re-election even because I was doing this. And, you know, uh, most people in elected office, that's something that they really care about because they don't like seeing the, the headlines. They don't like taking the incoming. And I had a lot of my sports saying, just start, you know, just mandate something, do something. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not the right thing to do. You as a leader have to care more about protecting the jobs and the livelihoods and the freedoms of the people you represent than you do about protecting your own political hide. And I was willing to let the chips fall where they may to stand and do the right thing and to fight back. Another example, I think the First Lady mentioned, and it's sad that we're even having to have these fights, but there is a movement in this country uh, to indoctrinate kids and sexualize the curriculum, even of very young kids in elementary school. So in the state of Florida, we said, you know, that is not acceptable. And I have young kids, so I'm sensitive to this, but I'd like to think that even if I didn't, I would say the same thing. It's wrong to teach a first grader that they were born in the wrong body. It's wrong to tell a third grader that their gender is a choice. That is inappropriate for school. And so we did uh, a bill, Parents' Rights in Education, that basically protected parents and protected the kids against that. And parents around Florida liked it. Uh, most people liked it. Media didn't like it, of course. The left didn't like it. But we also had opposition from our most powerful company in Florida, Disney. And a lot of people were saying, you know, since they weighed in, you might as well forget about it. Uh, they cannot be beat. Uh, you're not going to be able to support this legislation. But, you know, um, I took an oath to support and defend the people uh, that elected me, not to subcontract out my leadership to a woke corporation based in Burbank, California. So we stood up, we fought back, and we won that battle, and our kids in Florida are better off because we stood up by and won. But that's the thing. It's one thing to fight. Now, many Republicans won't even do that. But if you stand up and fight, you got to fight so that you're actually winning. Uh, you, know, you can go off half cocked, you can run your mouth, you can do all this stuff, uh, but are you actually delivering victories? And yes, victories in the elections, and we've had trouble. Iowa's done great under Governor Reynolds. Florida's done great under our leadership in these elections, and that's great. But most Republicans in most parts of this country have been losing since 2016. Uh, and we've been losing Senate seats, House seats, governorships, you name it. Uh, we have to end that culture of losing. We do need to win and win big. Uh, and I'm somebody that's shown how to do that in the state of Florida. But that's just the opening piece of the puzzle. The rest is winning on all these important issues. And I'm the only one running for president who can say that I've delivered on 100% of my promises who can also say, I'm the only one that's actually beat the people who are causing all the problems in our country right now. We beat the teachers union when we did universal school choice. We beat George Soros when we removed two radical left-wing prosecutors who weren't enforcing the law. We beat Fauci on COVID. We beat the Democrats on ensuring election integrity. And on and on down the line, we have fought for things, but we have won those fights, and the state of Florida is better off. That's what we need to do nationally. You can have a slogan about building a wall. You can talk about draining the swamp. You can talk about all these things, and it's important. But we know what needs to be done. Now's the time to actually get it done. And I'll go in there. I'll be very focused. I'll be very disciplined. I already, I already thought through how you do all this and bring it, into, bring it in for a landing. Uh, but we've got to produce those results. And so we will win for you, we'll win for your family, and we'll win for this country. And then final thing is this country needs leadership. You, know, you look at what's going on in Washington, you know, it's like the Keystone Cops up there. I mean, they can get nothing right, nobody's stepping up to lead, 
There's no vision about the country's future, and that's really what leadership's about. You know, it's not about entertainment. It's not about the show. Uh, it's about setting that compass to true north, knowing you're going to take incoming fire, knowing they're going to come after you, but you're not diverting course. Uh, you are staying the course, and you are delivering big results for people. So uh, I will be a leader as the president that you can be proud of and that you can know is focused on your issues and I'm not distracted with any other issues. And I think that that's important. And if you think about what we need to do uh, as, uh, as a country, I don't like sitting here make promises because everyone makes promises and most people don't follow through with them. So what I like to think about is one, we need a president that can serve two full terms. Uh, that's very important. You don't want to give the Democrats back. They will reverse everything after four years. Just like Biden reversed all Trump stuff uh, right on day one. So if you serve two year, two full terms, that's eight years, it takes us to January of 2033. So instead of me telling you what I will do, uh, I'll fast forward to that point and then tell you what I'll be able to tell you I have done on your behalf. Number one. Number one, I'll be able to say that we've restored the American dream in this country. That people that work hard, get the most out of their God-given ability, can get ahead again. You're not going to have to contend with rising prices, high interest rates. We'll have reversed Bidenomics and gotten the bureaucracy and the red tape out of everybody's way. We'll have opened up all energy for production, so gas prices will be lower. Energy costs will be uh, lower, and we'll have reliable with a good national security. We'll also be able to say that we've restored the sovereignty of the United States of America. No more Mexican drug cartels running our southern border. No more illegal aliens pouring into the country. We will have deported illegals in record numbers. We will have, yes, built the border wall, which we've been waiting for for a long time. And probably most important, we will have held the Mexican drug cartels accountable, including through the use of military force, because they are killing our people, and it will stop on my watch. We'll also be able to say, as the only veteran running for president, uh, I'll be able to say that we have restored and revitalized the United States military, removed the woke ideology and the social experimentation from the military, successfully fended off the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party, and ensured that the 21st century is not a Chinese century, but is an American century. We'll also be able to say that schools in this country are not indoctrinating kids, they are educating kids once again. Parents' rights are respected all throughout the country. We've put a newfound emphasis on American civics and understanding the Constitution and what it means to be an American, and we will have left the woke mind virus in the dustbin of history where it belongs. I'll also be able to tell you that whether you live in a red state or a blue city, that criminals are held accountable for their crimes again. That we're not letting inmates run the asylum. We're not letting far left prosecutors ignore the law. That every American family has a right to raise their kids in peace and security. And that from sea to shining sea, the rule of law has been restored in the United States of America. And then finally, we'll be able to say that we have restored the U.S. Constitution to its centerpiece uh, of America's national political life. That means a limited government that works alongside us, not an unlimited, unaccountable bureaucracy that's weaponized against us, that imposes its will on us without our consent. We will have brought accountability to all the agencies involved with COVID-19 lockdowns and mandates and restrictions. Uh, and we will have ensured that something like that will never happen in this country ever again. The ne <laughs> we will be able to say that uh, we have restored uh, this government and returned this government to its rightful owners, not to the bureaucrats, but to we, the American people. And we're going to do a lot more, but if we can just say we did all those things,
then we'll be able to say that we've restored America to what President Reagan called a shining city on a hill. We will have turned her over to the next generation stronger, freer, and more prosperous, uh, and we will have answered this generation's call uh, to preserve freedom when it was threatened. And our founding fathers understood that every generation would be tested and would have to step up and get the job done. When they went to frame the U.S. Constitution in 1787, uh, the founders studied the history of every republic and the history of mankind because they wanted to be able to take lessons from all those republics that they could apply here in America. But there was really only one thing that all those republics had in common, and it was this. Every single one of them had failed. And so they understood it fell to the United States of America to determine once and for all, can people govern themselves can you have a society based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from the government? Can you have a society based on the rule of law, not the whim of individual men? Or was mankind forever destined to live under various forms of tyranny? And they fully expected that this country would answer that question once and for all. They also knew that just because they uh, enacted a Declaration of Independence and then later framed a constitution, that in and of itself wasn't the final answer to the question. When Benjamin Franklin walked out of the convention, he was asked, did you give us a republic or a monarchy? He said, a republic if you can keep it. They understood you could have the best constitution in the world, you can have the best declaration of independence in the world. These things don't run on autopilot. They require every generation of Americans uh, to step up and defend freedom when it's at risk, including sometimes putting on a uniform, risking your life, and even giving the last full measure of devotion for service to this country. Now, we are not called upon to give sacrifices of that magnitude, but what we are called upon to do is to do justice to those sacrifices, to ensure that those sacrifices weren't made in vain, to ensure that we preserve what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty. This is a fire that burned in Independence Hall in 1776, when 56 men pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to create a new nation conceived in liberty. It's a fire that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when our nation's first Republican president pledged this nation to a new birth of freedom. It's a fire that burned on the beaches of Normandy when a band of brothers stormed France, defeated Nazi Germany, and preserved liberty throughout the world. It's a fire that burned at the foot of the Berlin Wall when a resolute Republican president stood in 1987 and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and eventually led to the demise of the Soviet Union. This is our responsibility, to carry that torch to preserve the sacred fire of liberty. It's not a responsibility I run from. It's a responsibility I welcome. There are times when you have to stand up. There are times when you have to lead, and there are times you have to get the job done. This is one of those times. I'm asking for your support on January 15th in the Iowa caucus. I'm asking for you to get friends, family, neighbors, coworkers to come out and make your voice heard. The people of Iowa have it within their power to change the trajectory of the United States of America. Uh, as somebody who's the nominee for this party, uh, I will get the job done, not just with the presidential election, but with Congress and the Senate and bringing Republicans in up and down the ballot, just like we did in Florida. I'll always be a leader that conducts myself in a way you can be proud of. Uh, and as the president, I will get the job done. We will reverse the decline of this country. And I promise you this, I will not let you down. Thank you all. God bless you. Take some questions. Yes.
Great. So, uh, okay. So, great. Great question. So, uh, one was about the dollar, about our fiscal situation, and then the other is when you know when you take an oath as a military officer, you're taking an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And how do you do that as President of the United States? So, first on the later part. So, for example. We need to stop being politically correct in this country. You know, you have this Israel-Hamas war, and then what happens on these college campuses? You have people that are cheering on Hamas terrorists. It turns out a lot of them are foreign students on visas. I can tell you when I'm president, if you're in this country as a foreigner on a visa, making common cause with terrorist groups, I'm canceling your visa and I am sending you home. This is ridiculous. Why are we sitting here letting this happen to our country? So yes, you've got to be, you've got to take appropriate action regardless of political correctness. Now in terms of the dollar, we have the reserve currency in the world as the United States of America. There's a challenge to that with China and some of these other countries. Now China's got a lot of economic problems. They got a lot of debt. They've got demographic problems. We need to exploit those. And have better policy so that we're not giving China a free lunch anymore. Uh, you know, I, in Florida, I banned China from buying land in the state of Florida. No farmland, none of that. We kicked them out of our universities. We cracked down on them stealing trade secrets. So we've been very strong, uh, and I think we need to do that all throughout the United States. But the dollar will remain the reserve currency if America is strong. If we're strong. There's not any better option, as, as, as big of the challenges we have, if we're strong, our economy's sound, people are still going to go to the dollar, even in spite of the more recent problems with all the debt that, that we've done. So that, that's the good news. You know, the bad news is, is since March of 2020, they've added like what, eight trillion, nine trillion to the debt? Uh, and, and a lot of this was because of COVID, but it was not justifiable what they did. Uh, they panicked, they shut down the country, and they printed trillions and trillions of dollars uh, that has led to the inflation that we have under with both Republicans and Democrats responsible for this. So uh, obviously we got to stop spending money at that level, and I'll fight Congress to do it. The other thing is, another problem is the Federal Reserve. You know, the Federal Reserve has put all this money into supply and then tried to say there wasn't going to be inflation that it was temporary, and then inflation took off, and they've been raising interest rates, and that's hurt a lot of people. So we need new leadership at the Fed. They should not be an economic central planner. The only thing they should do is ensure stable currency. That is it. They should not have any power beyond that, and they've been doing this quantitative easing and, and printing all this money ever since the financial crisis in 2008. And look, if you could just print your way to prosperity, then why not just print, right? But I think we all know eventually the bill comes due. The bill is partly coming due with the higher prices you're paying. The bill is partly coming due with the interest on the debt that is ballooned in the federal budget to where that's going to be more than even we spend on the military in a given year very soon. Probably a trillion dollars a year just to pay interest on the debt. Just a few years ago, it was like $250 billion. So we've got to get real here in Florida uh, I cut taxes every year, we ran surpluses every year, and I paid down 25% of our state's total debt that we've had in the entire history of Florida. I've retired 25% of that in just five years. So it can be done, you just gotta leave. Yes. Okay, that's a great question. So the question is about dealing with this massive administrative state that we have, uh, which has become a massive threat to freedom. And part of the reason is, is our founding fathers designed a constitution with three branches of government, legislative, executive, judicial. We now in practice have four branches of government. You have legislative, executive, judicial, and then you have the bureaucracy that Hey, they, they, some of these bureaucrats just laugh at the public. Hey, you can elect who you want. 
They don't give a damn who you're electing. They're going to do what they want to do. That is not the way our founders designed this system. That is not constitutional government. And that is not something that is sustainable if you want to have a free society. So I am going to reconstitutionalize the federal government. Uh, we are not going to let the bureaucrats run amok. Agencies like the FBI um, are going to be overhauled in a very big way. Uh, when they're abusing power by going after parents at school board meetings, uh, uh, working with tech companies to stifle dissent and censor, I'm firing those people. I'm not going to let them get away with it. We're going to clean house. Are you kidding me? We're also going to put out an executive decree to all agency heads, cabinet secretaries, reduce your footprint in Washington, D.C. by at least 50%. Uh, and that's going to help reduce power in Washington. We are going to take some agencies and move them in other parts of the country. So, for example, I've already said, Iowa, if they want the Department of Agriculture, Iowa will have first dibs on getting the Department of Agriculture. What you need is, you need people that staff these agencies who actually come from the American people, not separate in Washington, D.C., where they've accumulated this power and then they rule over us. That's not what the Founding Fathers intended. So we're going to do that. Uh, we're also going to make sure, we're going to take 50,000 employees who are involved in policy making. We're going to reclassify them under a different schedule. There's going to be no civil service involvement at that point, And they'll be able to be fired at will. And we will fire people who are not following the policy. So there's going to be big changes. And uh, But here's the thing. In, Every, we've been complaining about this for years. They're not going to just give up this power willingly. So you need a president that understands the constitutional authority of the president under Article 2, that can pull the appropriate levers of power to be able to move in our direction, that's focused and disciplined and understands that this is something that is um, not going to happen overnight. This is something that you really got to be determined to do. But I think there's no, we have no other choice because the government isn't responding to the people anymore. And that's not the way a, a Republican form of government is supposed to operate. So I have a plan to deal with it. I'm the only one that's going to be able to get it done. And all I can say is the people that um, like the way things are going in Washington are cushy and are doing well there, buckle your seatbelt because there's going to be some big changes. Yes, sir. No, it's a good, what's your name? What's your name? Yeah, Norman, thanks for the question. So basically he says, um, here in Iowa, we, we love our governor. I love your governor too. She's done a great job and I'm proud that she's supporting me for president. And he said, would there be um, a, a spot in the administration wh where she could potentially serve? And look, I just wanna be clear. I know some Iowans wanna keep her here so I don't want to get too far over the skis, but what I would say is, I mean, obviously she'd be qualified to do pretty much any of these things. I mean, uh, the best training for leadership uh, at the federal level, either president, vice president, or cabinet secretary, is being the governor of a state. You, know, you have to lead. You know how to do this stuff. And so she's shown an ability to do that um, in ways that, that, that are better than you know, most governors in the country. And um, I'm, I'm proud that she's supporting me. And you ought to be proud that, that you have her as your governor. I mean, in Florida, I get a front row seat to what's happening in the country. Because anytime uh, some blue city elects some bozo that does dumb things, people flee to my state and they tell me about it. And, you know, I debated Newsom in California uh, the other night. And I knew a lot about California because I had people fleeing. I grew up in Florida. I never saw a California license plate my whole time growing up in Florida. And why would you leave? I mean, they have great weather, they have mountains, they have coasts, they have all kinds of stuff. Um, and people just didn't leave California, even though they have always had high taxes because it's such a naturally beautiful place. And then he becomes governor, they go kooky left, and they're driving people out by the hordes, and they tell me about the problems. You know, I did the debate, and you know, I was able to hold up a map of San Francisco. And this map is something that was done 
by this um, watchdog group where they would actually plot on the map reports of human feces being found in public on the streets of San Francisco. This is not normal behavior, but the entire San Francisco is covered with these spots. And I'm just thinking to myself, is that not the perfect example of failure, you know, from what you're seeing? So you see people fleeing California, Illinois, Minnesota, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, all these places. Uh, and you guys are doing it right here in Iowa. And you should be proud of what the governor's done and what your legislature has done. Because that's not the norm throughout this country. Yes, sir. Great. Well, I think it's a great question. Why am I a better choice than Trump? Well, one, uh, I'm more likely to get elected in this country. The reality is the media and the Democrats want him to be nominated. The minute he is, if he is, you're going to see a much different posture in how they're, they're, they're doing all this. Trust me, that will happen. You know, he won Florida by a couple points. I won Florida by 20 points. Uh, and that's just the way you got to do it. Second, uh, I'm more likely to get all this stuff done. I did 100% of my promises as governor of Florida. Uh, he came in and I loved his platform in 2016 about building the wall and have Mexico pay for it, draining the swamp, holding Hillary accountable, eliminating the debt. Problem is none of those things actually got done. Um, he spent his first full day in office arguing with the media about his crowd size at his inauguration. That's a lack of focus, that's a lack of discipline, and I have that focus and discipline. You know, sometimes, I think most of the time, He's his own worst enemy by not being able to control his mouth. And that has consequences for governance and us being able to get things done. Uh, I do not believe any Republican president, the media is going to be after you, the left, all that, 100%. But if they're shooting at you, don't respond by shooting yourself in the foot. That's not the way it works. And so from that perspective, I do think it goes back to military. I have more of a military bearing uh, about accomplishing the mission. Another thing is, is he's running, if you listen to the stuff he's saying, about personal retribution and about himself and his own uh, issues. Um, I'm not running about my issues. I'm running about your issues. I'm running about your family. That's going to be the focus for me. My wife, our young kids, that's my job at home. And if I'm not doing that, I'm going to be 100% focused on reversing the decline of this country, which I think is very important. Another thing, I think this country definitely needs a reckoning for what happened during COVID-19. Fauci, CDC, NIH, all that stuff. Our economic problems go back to March of 2020. A lot of our social problems were exacerbated by what happened in March of 2020. I don't think you would have had the BLM riots happen the way they did if it wasn't for the lockdowns and all those other things. Um, Donald Trump has said he did everything right during COVID. He said his vaccine saved 100 million lives. What that means is even if he could get elected, he is never going to revisit any of that. I can tell you on day one, we will begin to hold all those agencies accountable, and you're going to see a major house cleaning in all of them because I think you just have to. Another thing, uh, when the BLM riots happen, I called out the National Guard in Florida immediately. I was not going to let our cities burn in the state of Florida. We backed the police, and guess what? We were fine. <laughs> Trump, he tweeted law and order, but he didn't take any action to ensure law and order. I would never have let Minneapolis burn down. I would never have let these other cities. These cities... It's going to take decades for them to recover uh, from those riots. You can't just say it. you got to actually do it. So I think I am less talk and more action, and I think he is more get on social media, do his thing, kind of that, but then doesn't have the follow-through 
And then finally, I would just say, you know, some of the things that we look at as Republicans that have frustrated us the most over the years, for example, the Hunter Biden laptop story and the censorship of that by social media, working with the FBI and all this other stuff. You know, I thought that that was a, a, a massive uh, injustice that that happened. And a lot of us have complained about it. But who was president then? Biden was not president yet. Trump was president. He did not have control over his own agencies. I would never have let that happen when I, if, as president. And if someone tried to do it, they would be out of a job the next day. It's just a difference about focusing on, on your job, not getting distracted, and holding people accountable. And I didn't think to do that. And then, then just the final thing, look, the way I conduct myself as a leader, I see through the prism of being a dad of a first grader, a fifth grader, and a preschooler. Uh, my wife and I want to be role models to our kids. Uh, and we're conscious about how we conduct ourselves. Uh, we always want to conduct ourselves in a way that they can grow up and be proud of. Uh, and really conduct ourselves in a way that is um, uh, more consistent, I think, with the best aspirations of this country. I think we need a president uh, who people will be willing to rally behind. Uh, and in fact, the matter is, the minute Trump is in anything, immediately everybody goes to their camps. And there's no way you're going to ever be able to break through any of the polarization. In Florida, I took a 50-50 state and made it a 60-40 state. I'm going to take strong positions. I'm going to govern bold colors, not pale pastels. Not everyone's going to like the decisions I make. That's just the price of leadership. But I'm not going to unnecessarily alienate people. Uh, if someone agrees with me 50%, I want them on the team then for that 50%. If somebody agrees with me 80%, they're not my 20% enemy. you got to build, uh, a, a, I think, a lasting majority if we want to be able to turn this country around. And I think there's just too many people that are dug in against Trump. You will never see that happen, and we're never going to be able to get out of this rut uh, that we're in where half the country's on one side, half's on the other. Yep. Good question, and, and I think it's important because you can't just govern through executive order. You have to get this stuff through Congress to have lasting impact. Otherwise, Democrats come in just reverse it. So the question is, Congress is basically uh, rudderless. Uh, they can't get anything done. There's no unity. It's just a lack of leadership. When you have a president that's going to be a leader, that's going to articulate a vision that galvanizes the people, they will fall into line. That happened under President Reagan. Um, it could have happened under President Trump uh, if he had taken maybe a different tack on some stuff, but it, that's how I did it in Florida. I came in as governor of Florida with a 15 year, 12 years of the governor and the legislature being at loggerheads, even though they were Republicans. And I came in and I was like, look, um, I have to have articulate an agenda that the public responds to. And then what happens is the public tells their representatives and senators, hey, you better be with the governor on this. We like what the governor's doing. And that, that helps get them where you need to be. The other thing is, is I don't demand that they just genuflect to me just because I'm the executive. They got elected in their own right. They have districts. They have different things they promised. So I'll say, okay, well, what do you guys think is important? What would you like to accomplish? And if it's not, if it's something, as long as it doesn't offend my promises or principles, I was like, you know what, I want you to be successful too. I'm going to work with you on that. You know, you need that, let's go, let's get it done. And then when you do that, uh, they then have more a buy-in and wanting to do the things that you do. But it's just a different way of working with the legislature. And I think the Congress is more difficult to corral than a state, I 100%. But I think the underlying principles are the same. Ultimately, these folks want to be on the right side of their voters. And if the voters are siding with the president and the president's agenda, we're going to get the Republicans to fall in line. And I'll make sure of that. Last question, ladies and gentlemen. Last question.
So the question is, is um, okay, you know, you, you can talk about Republicans. We probably agree on 90% of the stuff. You know, there may be, but that's not enough to win a general election. You got to win people that uh, may be Republicans that don't vote in primaries, independents. Some people may be uh, on the other side. And I think it is, is what can you deliver for people? So, for example, when I ran for election in Florida in 2022, I got support from people that had voted for Bernie Sanders. Why? Well, a lot of them saw me protecting their jobs against these COVID vax mandates. I got a lot of Democrat parents who were supporting me because of school choice and the scholarships that we provided for their kids. Other parents appreciated us getting the indoctrination out of the schools and focusing on the basics. So I think it's just having an agenda that uh, speaks to people's daily concerns. And the fact is, you know, if you're very far left, obviously you're gonna be in a spot, but most people, what are they concerned about? They're concerned about the rising prices and the interest rates. Uh, we've done in Florida, uh, you know, we've done tax relief. We've done things to help people with that. Uh, they're concerned about the border. They're concerned about crime. They're concerned about the state of the world and, and, and they don't wanna see us dragged into a conflict. They're concerned about all these things and we're gonna have a, a message and agenda uh, that is gonna be able to do it. The good news is, is I think the vast majority of people wanna move on from Biden it may not be Biden as the candidate. That's why I debated Newsom, because we got to be ready for whoever they throw. Uh, but I do think people are going to want uh, a different course. And in Florida, you know, we were able to win independence by 18%. We won uh, women by 9%, and even got 50% of single women, which no Republican has been able to do. Why? Because we were delivering for the single moms on all these key issues. So it's very important. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do the woman back there, then you. So go ahead. Yep. Go, go ahead. Okay, so uh, questions about school security, particularly with Northern Iowa. I'm not sure about the details on Northern Iowa, but I can tell you what we've done in Florida, and I think is a model for the country. Uh, so particularly with K-12 uh, uh, security, when I got elected, it was uh, the same year that the Parkland massacre happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. So I came in the January after that had happened, and my job was to change the way Florida did school security. So what we've done is, uh, every school has a school resource officer for security. We also have a guardian program where faculty are allowed to, if they're trained, uh, do uh, concealed carry. Now the media gets so mad at teachers should not have to carry. Well, of course they don't have to. No one's saying they do. But if you have an administrator or whatever who does that, they can do it. But here's the thing. These people that want to do harm, they want to go to the area that there's the least likelihood that they will face blowback. So they want to go to places where they're gun-free zones. So just having a guardian program tells them they don't know what they're walking into. And so that served as a deterrent. We also put money into making sure that these campuses aren't wide open. You know, this guy in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he's walking in with a trench coat, uh, should never have been able even to get to a building. Uh, so we've been doing all that. So we put over a billion dollars into it. Uh, we also have better resources to identify students who may be problematic. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, when that happened, no one even knew officially who did it. And almost everyone in that community said it was going to be this guy who did it. Because everyone knew he was off his rocker. No one wanted to do anything about it. They didn't want to get him committed mentally. They didn't want to hold him accountable when he was committing other crimes. we got to take this stuff seriously. Uh, and hold people accountable. So that's a lot of stuff. I know there's some grants federally and whatnot. I think the states need to be in control of this though. I think they're gonna do a much better job uh, with ensuring the security of the schools. But that's been one of the top priorities that I promised I would do and that we've delivered on in Florida. Yes, ma'am.
So, so I, I think this gets into this whole DE&I stuff uh, that you see where they try to divvy up students on the basis of um, ethnicity, different types of characteristics. Uh, we eliminated DE&I in the state of Florida in our schools and our universities. Um, honestly, it's toxic, it's divisive, it's teaching kids to treat people differently based on characteristics other than the content of someone's character. Uh, or merit. And I think we have to have education, jobs, military. Uh, it needs to be done based on merit. You earn these positions, you earn your grades, you do all that, uh, and it shouldn't matter what group you're a part of, and we shouldn't be divvying people up into groups in this country. That is not going to end well, uh, and I guarantee you uh, when I'm president, um, that whole practice is going to end throughout the federal government. First day. Great. Okay, so the question, uh, John Kerry, get rid of on day one. You know, I think about you have you have all these you have all these guys on the left. They're lecturing us about global warming and all this stuff. You know, they hate farmers because they say the agriculture cut contributes all this stuff, and yet. John Kerry hasn't given up his private jet. Obama's got an oceanfront mansion on Martha's Vineyard. And then Biden, you know, he's not done anything to hold China accountable other than making sure Hunter's getting his money. So it's like, these guys are all talk on all this stuff. They want to impose burdens on you, but they don't want to live under those burdens. So he'd be gone in day one. What would the cabinet look like? So my view on this is um, I don't care uh, whether people flatter me or or kiss my rear end. I want people that are gonna be able to accomplish the mission. And you gotta have values aligned in terms of where we wanna go. Uh, the individuals have to have the backbone and the fortitude to be able to see through that agenda in the face of a lot of opposition, because there's gonna be opposition from the entrenched bureaucracy, there's gonna be opposition from uh, the media and the Democrats and the left, and you just have to have that. So for example, in Florida, our Surgeon General is a guy named Joseph Latipo, a doctor from UCLA that I recruited in. And he was basically the anti-Fauci. He was against lockdowns, school closures, all that. So I brought him in and I said, look, you're the only one in the country in a position like this that's gonna be willing to say this stuff. They're gonna come at you. You better be ready. Uh, and he's like, no, I get it, I'm good. And then, you know, sh sure enough, a month or two later, you know, I saw him and I'm like, listen, uh, I don't know what you've been doing lately, but uh, I see that uh, you're being attacked by the corporate media. You must be doing a damn good job, so thank you for what you're doing. But I think like you just have to have people that understand if you're doing the right thing, they're going to come after you, and you just have to have peace with that. And if it's something that bothers you, look, human nature, everyone wants to be liked, right? Uh, but if your job as a the Secretary of Defense or a Fraternity General or some of these positions is you want official Washington to like you, they're only gonna like you if you're not effective as a Republican. So it does require, I think, some intestinal fortitude. It requires some backbone uh, to be able to do this. Uh, the people in these agencies, like if you're the Secretary of State, you see how these uh, bureaucrats in the State Department behave. I mean, they think that they can do whatever they want. You know, they put up transgender flags on our embassies across the world. It's embarrassing what they're doing, but you just have to understand, they're gonna fight you. They're not just gonna do. So you've gotta be willing to go in there, clean house, hold people accountable. So sharing the vision, but also having that, having that toughness. I think it's really, really important. Anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, with an average of 20 veterans committing suicide every day, what is your position on legalizing So here's what we're gonna do to combat that. Um, uh, I'm not sure that that's the direction uh, we would go. What we're gonna do is recognize that the VA is not doing a good job. The VA is pumping a lot of these veterans with, with pharmaceuticals and it, it creates problems and I think it's contributed to a lot of the suicides, quite frankly. Uh, so what we're gonna do is recognize that the VA's utility is limited because it's such a big bureaucracy. 
uh, Casey, my wife, created in Florida a concept that your governor is actually going to do in Iowa uh, called the Care Portal. And she first did it for welfare assistance. So if somebody goes in for welfare, instead of just giving them a check and they're kind, they have that relationship, this Care Portal brings in churches, it brings in charities, it brings in volunteers, it brings in businesses. Someone has a need, say there's a mom with twins who just got evicted from her apartment, she doesn't have any money. That goes out to the churches, it goes out to the volunteers, and if a church comes or a volunteer group comes, they help. A lot of times that person never goes back for assistance again. So I want to do a similar concept with veterans. You go into the VA, it's a massive bureaucracy, but you put in, we're going to have every veterans group in the country plugged in that wants to be. We'll have charities, we'll have businesses, we'll have individuals. So this veteran's got problems with post-traumatic stress. What can you do? I have veteran mental health clinics in Florida have nothing to do with the state. It's, it's privately funded. I've got a, a, a program in Florida where they train service dogs to help veterans with post-traumatic stress and so that they can cope with, with, the, with the illness. And the suicide rate's gone down dramatically. So we're gonna have that concept of the government being a facilitator to all these great resources uh, that are available uh, for use. But um, uh, right now in the current course, I don't think you're gonna make a dent in the suicide rate unless we try something much different. So, so I'm game to do that and I think it's gonna be good. Yes, sir. So I think that if you're able to work, then uh, if you're receiving benefits, you should re be required to work. Um, I think that, that I think work requirements for like welfare, I think is really, really important. Um, you know, you're, you don't have to, I mean, if you're not getting a check from the government, then you don't have to, you can work or not work. If you can support yourself, it's fine. But if you're getting that type of, of benefit uh, and you have the, in your ability to work, obviously if someone is completely incapacitated, that's different. But yeah, you should have to work and look for work. And um, that's just what we got to get back to. I think it'll be very important. Well, so the question is, how come China is buying land around this country, even next to military bases? Um, well, you probably should ask Nikki Haley about that because they gave a lot of land in South Carolina. I don't know why they did that. In Florida, we banned that practice. Uh, it's not right for this country. They should not be getting in our food supply. They should not be able to eavesdrop on military bases or any of that. So as president, I'm gonna impose that policy nationwide. Uh, we will eject the Chinese from some of the land that they already have. And we're going to defend this country. They're an adversary. I mean, we've got to do what's right. Come on. Well, thank you for yours. And all the veterans here, God bless you guys for serving. Grassley. Sure. Yeah, so we, it's a great question. So I've already said that as president, we're going to do uh, uh, support Governor Reynolds' request to do E15 year-round. 
Uh, so we'll do that. I think that that's something that will be beneficial to farmers here. And then we will also allow even higher blends at the discretion of folks. I mean, if people want to buy that fuel with higher blends and people want to make vehicles, you should be able to do it. We're not going to have the government uh, inhibit that, and we'll let people make decisions accordingly. The other thing we're going to do uh, to help farmers is um, uh, we are going to uh, eliminate Biden's electrical vehicle mandates. Uh, and honestly, this helps the whole country. But he wants to force, so I debated Newsom the other night from California. So this is just how crazy this is. Newsom last year did a mandate, and it, does, it hasn't taken effect yet, but it will pretty shortly. You're not allowed to buy a new car in California unless it's an electric vehicle. And so that's gonna be very expensive for a lot of people. Uh, honestly, it's gonna crash the market. But here's the kicker. Two days later, the state of California issued uh, a warning. All EV holders in California, owners, do not plug in your EV. The grid does not have capacity to handle your EV. Well, what's going to happen when you have 10 million more EVs on there? They already have rolling blackouts. What Biden's doing, he's, he's trying to kneecap uh, a reliable energy like oil and gas. He doesn't believe in nuclear. And so he's going to end up trying to push you for an electric vehicle, increase demand for reliable energy by reducing the supply. You're going to have rolling blackouts all across this country. That will happen. So that's wrong in and of itself. Second, it will bankrupt the automobile companies because people do not want you. I had a, before I was governor, I drove a Ford F-150. I didn't want it to be electric. I wanted it to be gas powered. That's just the reality. So the, the market isn't there for the mandates. So that's going to cause huge problems. And then for the farmers, the more you uh, get away from liquid fuel, it's going to hurt your ability uh, to, to be able to make money uh, with, uh, with, with alternative fuels and renewable uh, stuff. So, so that's just, so those are two things. And then the third thing is, is we're not going to let California dictate how farmers do their jobs here in Iowa. That's wrong, and we're not going to do that. And I think that we shouldn't do that. And then the final thing is, you know, the EPA, uh, we're going to rein in the EPA. They should not be coming on your property as a farmer and saying you got a puddle on your property, therefore they can regulate it. I know the Supreme Court kneecapped the WOTUS stuff, but Biden's trying to do it again, and we're just not going to let that happen. Uh, you know how to do your land better than the government knows how to do your land. Last question, ladies and gentlemen, or last question. Have a question. Are you really? Thank you so much. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much. Well, whip up support from your friends and family. Love to see you. Do you have a question? You just want a picture. What's your name? Ryan. What is it? Ryan. Ryan. Okay. Is there anything on your mind? Maybe not a question. What do you think? Oh, yeah. You like space? We're going to do some good stuff with Space Force, so stay tuned. Come on. All right, well, listen, January 15th, I'm asking for your support. I'm asking you to get friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, everyone you can. Iowa has a huge, huge role to play here. You guys can make a big difference. We've gotten huge momentum going for us. You know, the media does not want me to be the candidate. That should be the best endorsement for me that I could possibly have. Thank you. God bless you.